so much. Yes, so I work at Edinburgh University, and I have a background in AI and robotics. I think that's maybe an, a, an easier way to describe who I am. Uh, and today I want to spend um, some time uh, talking to you about AI, describing a bit about what AI is, and then taking a moment to reflect over what are the barriers for adoption for AI? And in particular, what are the human barriers that haven't enabled us or are creating challenges for us to be able to adopt AI? And I want to make this presentation a little bit technical, simply because, as it was mentioned, my background is in computer science and engineering, and I like to get a bit technical, and I hope that you will, you will bear with me through those parts. So just very short about me, so I was, um, born and raised in Canada, um, and I, uh, I came to Sweden to do research within AI and robotics. Actually, at Örebro University, there was some leading researchers, all of them coming from different parts of Europe uh, and the world, who congregated, I don't know why, in Örebro, uh, and was looking in particularly at how you combine AI and robotics. So that is kind of my, my specialization. Uh, but today I want to talk to you about AI in general. And everyone is talking about AI, right? I mean, there is an AI buzz all around, and I think that that AI buzz is very well warranted. One of the things that I think is important to remember is, of course, that AI, like many other of uh, these sort of groundbreaking technologies, usually has a bit of a roller coaster ride. In fact, this isn't the first time AI has been hyped. AI was hyped very much in the late 50s, early 60s. And indeed, when AI was hyped then, the vision of AI was integrated with robotics. If you remember those movies that came from that period, you always saw this very intelligent or maybe not so intelligent robot that was going to take over the world type of thing. But AI couldn't really deliver on its promises. And the reason, because, the reason for that is because we didn't have the computational power. And what we saw is we saw this marriage of AI and robotics ending up in divorce, where automation, the field of robotics, did very well. Um, and you had companies, even Swedish companies like ABB, who thrived on automation. But the field of AI went a little bit up and down. But now we are in what we call an AI summer, where AI technologies are on the rise. And this has been the case since the mid-90s. And there are applications of AI all around us. For example, we can use AI in order to speed up medical annotations, so we can look at images and try and give them annotations, so be able to label them very quickly. We even see this kind of technology being used, for example, to identify whether skin lesions could lead to cancer at an early stage. I think what's interesting in this particular image is the number of images that were needed to reach the same level as a human. You needed 130,000 clinical images to get the same level as a human. Now, we have that kind of data available, so that's good. The fact that it's the same level as a human, I'm not quite sure what to say because humans sometimes are not that good. In fact, dermatologists tend to disagree quite a bit amongst each other. Interestingly enough, if you show a dermatologist the same image, he or she will also disagree with themselves. So often when we compare AIs to human, we have to keep in mind that sometimes humans don't do the tasks so well. But at the same time, we can also use AI for its predictive ability. That means the ability for AI to look at something in an early stage and give a prediction. And perhaps prediction is even more clear when we see things like um, autonomous driving. So uh, in this particular video, you'll hear the car warn the driver before an accident happens. Listen to the beep. So the beep comes before the accident. And it's that ability for prediction which can complement our human intelligence. And AI can be used for many other things. AI, for example, can be used for image annotation. So these are images, and the description in natural language is being generated by an AI. So you have a man in a black shirt playing guitar, 
or a boy is doing a backflip on a wakeboard. That image is actually wrong, but it's pretty hard to see. So you can use AI to help annotate lots of images online. You can use AI even for creativity, like here is a handbag, if you look at the one at the bottom, that has been drawn by a human hand, but filled in by an AI. And we have lots of examples of startups, like, for example, this one, Volumental, that is using AI technology to analyze feet and then give recommendation for shoes. And all of a sudden, we're learning a lot about Swedish people's feet. And feet don't look the way we thought they did, at least not from the shoe designer perspective. And my personal favorite is that you can also use AI in order to train robots. So this is a robot who is trying to learn how to flip a pancake. And it learns this task not by being programmed, but by failing and learning from its mistakes. This is a technique in AI called reinforcement learning. When the robot does well, we reward it. How do you reward a robot? You give it the number one. And when it does bad, you punish it by giving it a number zero. And this kind of reinforcement learning eventually gets the robot over time to figure out how to do the task. 20 trials, but you try it at home. See if you manage in 20. This is about 50 trials, and we get the robot flipping the pancake. And you know, this may seem like all good fun, but there's actually a very serious side to this application. Because it means that when we give robots to companies, particularly the small and medium-sized companies that are out in rural areas. Today, we have to give them a robot, and they have to hire two or three people to program it. But by getting robots to learn, we can actually allow automation and these kind of technologies to come to many different people that need automation solutions and bring manufacturing closer to home instead of you know, maybe manufacturing things far away and then impacting the environment negatively. So AI has a huge potential. But again, I don't want to only talk about the potentials because I think we've been talking about potentials quite a lot. The question I want to ask is that if AI is so great, why isn't there more of it today? What are the barriers that we see in adopting AI? Well, I put four on my slide. These are the four barriers, and I, I, I express them in a very non-scientific way. So as a professor, you could slap me on the wrist for saying it like this. But I think that this is at least, hopefully, a pedagogical and clear way of what the barriers could possibly be. And what I want to do now for the next 20 minutes or so is I want to go through these barriers one by one. And let's start with the first one. You can't use something if you don't understand it. This is perhaps the biggest problem or challenge we have with AI. So let's just say, show of hands, how many of you think you know what AI is? Right, and this is the technology that's going to be general purpose and revolutionize many sectors. So there's only a few hands that have gone up. So let's try and take the next few minutes and see if we can get at least a rudimentary understanding of AI. So we all know software, right? And AI is software. And when today, when we create software, let's take, for example, your web browser, which is a perfect example for something called Internet Days. A web browser consists of many lines of code. It can consist somewhere of about 500,000 to about 3 million lines of code, depending on the browser that you're using. Now, for the most part, all of that code is sort of coded by a very well-paid uh, human being, like the one in this image. And what that code does is it tells you the behavior of the program, right? If you do this, then this will happen. Now, what we do like to do with computers is sometimes we want to create recipes, right? Algorithms that tell us sequences of steps to take in order to get a desired behavior. Now, if we want to imagine that AI is an algorithm, what we want to do with AI is we want an AI system really to figure out the exact steps of the algorithm a little bit by itself. And let me show you with an example. So if you imagine that AI is this big magic box, I won't tell you exactly what's in it yet. What you want an AI to do is to help you answer certain questions, like how do I get from A to B? 
And what you put inside this box is all the possible paths. So how do I get from Erebru to Stockholm? You put all the possible paths, and you want the AI to figure out by itself the best way to get there. Another question you can ask is, what is uh, the animal in the picture? And you put in all the possible pictures, and you tell it what animals there are in those pictures. And you want the AI to figure out by itself that dogs look like this way, um, they have ears that look like this, and so on, and it gives you the classification. Or what is causing my fever? You put in a lot of facts about illnesses, and the AI tells you, well, you probably have a common cold. So we want the AI to figure out the rules of the game on its own by looking at data. That's one way to describe AI. And in fact, when I take a look at the field of AI, hopefully you can read that, AI is actually quite a broad field that has a number of techniques that you use in order to figure out those rules. Some of them you learn, some of them you, you sort of code in in logic and so on. And I think this is a very nice picture. We sometimes call it the lemon, because if you're sitting at the back, it probably looks like a lemon, that gives you an idea of all the sub-areas of artificial intelligence, from machine learning, robotics, vision, um, natural language processing. So that's one way to describe AI. But what does AI look like? I think that's always interesting. So let's take a look at the AI of the 90s. So this is when we were all sitting at home watching Friends on TV. We had an AI that looked roughly like this. This is how AI solves a very fundamental problem called search. And what this is doing, and what I'm showing you here, is an AI that uh, can solve problems like uh, playing chess, which is uh, one of those historical moments, like I'm showing you in the video, where an AI beat a human. Now, I cannot show you the game of chess because to put it on one slide would be too complicated. So what I'm showing you on my slide is another game. I'm showing you tic-tac-toe. I have no idea what that's called in Swedish. And if you look at tic-tac-toe, you look at the very top of this kind of tree-like structure, you can see that there's a situation, a game situation, where there's a number of X's and a number of O's. And it's X's turn to make a move. And we let X be our AI. So our AI has to figure out what move to make. How does the AI solve the problem? Well, it simply models or entertains each and every possibility. Either the X can make, as you see in the, in the, on this side, uh, put an X in, in one of the boxes, or it can put it in another box, or on the far side, you see, it can put an X in another uh, box there in the middle. Now, depending on which move the AI would take, the O, which is the human, could take another move. And what the AI does is it plays out every possible scenario. And then, based on that, it kind of scores, well, which of the scenarios will lead to a likely win? It's a no-brainer, really. AI is actually not that intelligent sometimes. But that's how AI in the 90s worked. Now, we're not in the 90s anymore. If we fast forward up to around 2016, we started to realize that not all problems can be well modeled. So chess, for example, you know exactly which moves you're allowed to take and which ones you can't. But there are problems where the possibilities are literally endless. So instead of modeling everything, what you do is you learn from data. So in order to develop this kind of AI, what we did is we looked at the human brain and said, well, how does the human brain learn? And we have these great things called neural networks. And I wish I had three hours with you. I'd tell you how neural networks work, but I don't. So you just have to trust me on this. What you do with a neural network is you put in a lot of data, and then you can guide the network, or you can let the network on its own figure out what's important in that data. So if you imagine, if you remember my picture of a dog, you put in a lot of pictures, you let the neural network know, well, that has a picture of a dog, that has a picture of a cat, and then the neural network should figure out, well, what were the important features? And you can use these networks to do classification, so it can label things for you. But what's really exciting is that you can open up these networks and look and ask the network, how did you solve the problem? And when you see how computers solve problems, we can all of a sudden learn how we should solve problems. So what I showed you is I opened up the brain on face recognition. And here at the bottom layer, you see that first 
the neural network starts to see dark edges, light edges. Then the neural network starts to see structure. It starts to see, oh yes, eyes tend to be above noses. And then at the end, the neural network starts to build faces. So if any of you are sitting on massive amounts of data, but you don't know what the data is telling you, you can put it through a machine learning algorithm, and it can tell you how you solve the problem. But you know, that was 2016, and that, that's a pretty long time ago, right? Things move fast. So AI is constantly changing. And if we fast forward to 2019, we have all these new generation of algorithms. We're not just using AIs on their own. We're getting AIs to fight AIs. So this is an example of an AI called a Generative Adversarial Network, a G-A-N. And what they do is they put two neural networks against each other. One tries to solve a problem, and the other one, what it tries to do is sabotage the one who's solving it. And it sabotages it by creating data to fool the first network. And what we're interested in is in the saboteur. Because if the saboteur can create good data, all of a sudden we can use AI to create and generate synthetic data. So here's an example of an AI that has looked at a lot of artwork made by a human hand and been given the task, can you make completely unique artwork on your own? And the results, when we've asked the AI to generate landscapes, look a bit like this. Purely AI-generated landscapes. Now, when you trained an AI on Rembrandt's and asked it to generate faces, it's not so good. <laughs> and if you really want some nightmares at night, here we've asked an AI to generate nudes. I don't know. <laughs> so, how many of you feel like you have an idea of what AI is? Show your hands. There's a few more that came up. So the point being is that it's really important for us, all of us, to understand what this technology is about. And we have to put demands, particularly on our governments and on societal actors, to be better at educating us about these things. But that's not the only barrier. There are actually a few more that we need to go through. And one of them is that even if we have the technology, you won't use it if you don't trust it. And this we've seen before. And with AI, there is this challenge. Just to give you an example, those neural networks I told you about. Here is an example of a neural network that's been trained to identify what's in an image. Here the network says, I think it's a panda. I'm about 60% sure. Then we insert into the network some noise. I don't know what's in this noise, but there's something in this noise that disrupts the network. And now it thinks it's a gibbon, but now it's almost 100% sure. A gibbon is a type of monkey, by the way. We also see other examples in, for example, uh, the autonomous vehicle industry. This is adversarial uh, training, where you have uh, stop signs that have been basically uh, sabotaged. Someone has gone and put tape at very strategic positions in the stop signs, and all of a sudden, the AI no longer recognize it, it recognizes it as a stop. It sees it as a speed limit sign. And the other problem that we have with AI is that we have a lot of cases, particularly in industry, where it is absolutely vital and fundamental that we can verify what we're doing and we can reproduce what we're doing. And right now, AI falls a little bit short on these two things. So right now, we still haven't been able to verify things. And we've seen trends in AI that are really exciting. For example, trends in AI that can protect our privacy by getting AIs to talk to each other without sharing data. This is something called federated learning. But the question is, can we then verify that the AI will work properly? And all of this can be nicely described in this little vignette, uh, a story about a horse called Hans. This horse was claimed to be very clever because Hans apparently could add numbers together. What you would do is you would tell Hans, you know, two and three, and Hans would stomp his hoof five times. And the trainer went everywhere and sort of showed Hans off to the world and probably made quite a bit of money doing so. 
But in actuality, Hans never learned how to count. What Hans could do was read the audience. So when Hans was given two numbers, he would stomp his hoof. And when people were uh, looking at his hoof, he knew to keep moving it. Because when he reached the sum, in this case five, people would look up and look at the horse's face. And he would stop moving his hoof. So Hans knew how to stop stomping his hoof when you looked at his face, but he did not know how to add. And that is the dilemma that we are currently in with AI. Is it really learning what we think it's learning? Then there are some other problems. So you cannot buy it if you don't know what's being offered. This is perhaps one of the, the greatest challenges that I personally see with AI systems that cannot just be solved by more AI researchers. Indeed, there are lots of different competences that are needed to do good AI. You need people with deeply specific talent, like myself, uh, to conduct fundamental research on AI. You need people who know how to apply AI. That means that you can understand a problem and say, well, this algorithm will probably help you. But then there's a third competence that we're really missing today in Sweden, and perhaps even, if I dare say, in Europe. And that is the possibility to understand how to scale and commercialize breakthroughs in AI. It's basically the skill to find value from AI. And on the slide here, I'm sort of putting up a result from a Canadian study where they've asked companies that have tried to pursue AI what have been the major barriers. And their top three barriers in their AI journeys have not necessarily been technical ones. The first one has been challenging, challenges in measuring and proving the value of AI. Have we been able to demonstrate that, yes, this has effect? Challenges in working with partners and vendors so that they understand their needs for using AI. And difficulty finding the right use case for AI. So many people want to use AI, but maybe they haven't quite figured out where AI can do the best benefit. And lastly, you cannot scale something if you don't know how. And this is another challenge that I meet time and time again, and perhaps that we're starting to see. This is perhaps the thing that keeps me up at night, because I fear that if we do not solve this one, we'll end up in the next AI winter. And in Sweden, we know the winters can be long and dark. And the question is, how do we scale AI systems beyond just doing that really cool pilot, that really cool experiment, that really cool proof of concept? How do we actually integrate it into what we're doing every day? And there's a lot of challenges around this. One of them, let me say, is, is very technical. Because if you look at this slide, that little black box is the AI part of a larger system. And many systems that use AI need a lot of different pieces around it. And all of these different pieces around it need a lot of effort. So in order to really use AI, you don't need just AI. There are a lot of different components that you have to integrate. And I think we have to be uh, braver at taking steps to really scale up. And right now, we don't see so many of such initiatives. The other thing that I often hear is that people talk about AI um, being highly dependent on data. And that's true, uh, to some extent. Um, and I often hear people say, well, data is, you know, it's the new oil. Um, but I'm not entirely sure that that's an accurate comparison. I mean, it's true from maybe an economical point of view that data has a high value. But oil has a very interesting property. You can take oil and put it in one machine, and the machine will work. And you can take the same oil and put it in another machine, and it should work. And data doesn't necessarily have that interoperability. Uh, you can't use data everywhere so easily. And it's true also for AI. If I train an AI on faces, I can't use it to detect cancer in uh, mammograms. I can't take an AI system and move it around anywhere and expect it to work. 
So this is also a challenge about interoperability, which means that we need a lot of human effort to make AI work for everyone. So that's good from the perspective of jobs, if we're worried that AI will take away all our jobs. But it also means that our systems become increasingly complex. So these are kind of the, the human challenges that I see about AI. And the question is, well, what are we going to do about it? Well, I think there are many things that we need to consider. As I said, the potential is large. One of the things that I think we should start to look at, and we are starting to look at, and when I say we, I mean Sweden, is really building up what we call an ecosystem. I mean, if you think about the number of competences that we need, if you think about the infrastructure that we need, we really need a number of players to come forward and to work together. Now, I put on this slide a couple of things that I see as being sort of prerequisites for the ecosystem. We need a talent pool, including LLL. LLL stands for lifelong learning, from, from womb to tomb, if you want to put it in a very sort of blunt way. Meaning, how do we make sure that we're becoming aware of, of what AI is and getting those special competences? We need those research strengths, and there are some really nice initiatives. In fact, Swedes should feel very lucky because there's initiatives like uh, the, the Knut and Alice Wallenberg initiative called the VASP, where it's four billion Swedish crowns. This is one of the largest private investments ever in Europe when it comes to a research program. So, you know, having this ability to, to foster the next generations is important. But we need startups as well. We need to make sure that this comes out to industry. And certainly, not least, is intact with all of this development. We need public policy to protect the rights of individual citizens. And again, this requires a high level of understanding from our politicians about AI. And we should put more demands on them to get that understanding. Finally, this is my last slide, or second last slide. I'd like to just lift one story, because every year I find sort of that one AI story that I really like. And I mean, the, the, the big ones, they're doing lots of fun things, of course. But this is the story that I think is the best example of, of AI use and AI uptake. This is an example of a master student at the University of Texas. Her name is Anne Dottillo. And she was very interested in machine learning algorithms, but she's doing her master's in astronomy. So she has another discipline that's her main discipline. And she took the data from the Kepler Space Telescope, and she used an AI algorithm and combined those two things, and in her master's thesis discovered two planets. I don't know what you were doing when you were her age. I was not discovering planets. Not in that way. So I think that... You know, this is a very nice example of how when we open up information, we open up data, we open up algorithms, and we give it to those creative youth, we can really get some very exciting results. This is my last slide. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, this is exciting, but as you know, to a lot of people, AI is also slightly alarming. Mm -hmm. And I could tell from the presentation and from the words public policy there towards the end that you are not naive about what is happening uh, or what, about what the, the risks are here. But I think I would still like you to spell out mm -hmm. why is it important to do what you're kind of taking for granted in this, in this presentation. Mm -hmm. Why is it important that we develop AI rapidly? Why do we want it to scale? Especially since one of your own questions is, yeah. can we trust it? Yeah. Well, we have a huge number of societal challenges. We have an, an aging society. We have problems of, of um, sort of um, uh, large differences between urban environments and rural environments. We, ha we see large differences between uh, economical um, uh, opportunity. So, I mean, and, and not least our environment. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the example of the car. Uh, you know, when we drive a car, there is a lot of things happening around us. In fact, this is a very cognitively challenging task. That's why we don't do it when we're too young, we don't do it when we're too old, we certainly should never do it when we've had something to drink, because our brain cannot handle it. 
And if you look at these challenges that I, I lifted, maybe we also need a little bit of help. Maybe humans need a little bit of help to figure out, well, where are the problems in fact? What could be possible solutions? So AI has a huge uh, sort of potential to help us make a better future. Mm. And this is why we should panic, because those challenges are at our doorstep, and we need to confront them with new solutions. Okay, so this is actually not in my paper, but now that you said that, for a lot of the biggest problems, we know exactly what the solutions are. We know what actions need taking. There's just no political will or the private capital, capital well, big capital interest is stopping us from doing the actions. I'm, I'm a little bit concerned the, are we looking for, for solutions that could work around that? No, I, I don't think so. I mean, I don't think anything is as easy as, well, if you take this, this will solve all our problems. Mm -hmm. But I think there are many problems that we have where we still perhaps don't have the full understanding. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also believe, because I have a background in robotics, um, that automation can help in, in quite a number of things to, co to help us mitigate some of these challenges. So. I do see that AI combined maybe with other technologies and good decisions, so AI is a decision support, mm. this, could, this could help. But if you're right, I mean, if we, if we ignore what AI is telling us, then, well, there, there is very little hope that we can do. But hopefully we can work as sort of multi-front where we try and use technology to move forward and we have the wisdom to use it in the right way. So basically we can also, it's, it's helpful to always think of it not as an, as an agent in this system, but mm. as a tool uh, for, fact, for humans, yeah. In fact, and I actually don't like the term artificial intelligence. I, I prefer to talk more about augmented intelligence, taking it from a human perspective. So really trying to augment our own intelligence so that not only we can be more human, but we can be better humans. So it's like, I mean, I, I don't know, when I was in elementary school, having a calculator was a really big deal. Mm. I could count so much faster, and this is like that times a billion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe, um, uh, I don't know about a billion, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't actually count that far, so there we are, that's clearly the result. Now, I have a few questions about the specific questions as well. So, uh, when it comes to understanding, here is the lifelong learning Enable. Here they are, the enablers yep. of that. Uh, what is the need to know, sort of minimum, of what people need to understand? Is it enough to know ballpark what AI is? Do I have to know a little bit about how it works? Like to be a good citizen in this future that will be upon us in, in the next five years? So I, I, I cannot answer that simply because AI is constantly changing. Um, so I definitely, I mean, understanding that, that AI is. So s understanding that there is something called AI. And hopefully having, a, I would like it if people had a relatively sober approach to AI. So being able to look at it and say, well, what, what is it and what isn't AI? Now, as I mentioned at my talk, when I, t when I talk to researchers, I, I often have to get them to see AI a bit broader. Normally when I talk to the general public, I have to get them to really sort of see that AI is a bit narrower. So mm. there's a lot of things that we do in the digital realm that is not AI. So AI is not everything, and that understanding is, is important. But then there's something else that I think is also quite important, especially for kids, and that is the ability to uh, critically examine content. Um, so when I showed you the artwork that has been created, well, we all know that we're talking about deep fakes and these kind of things. To be able to assess the same way, you know, maybe we learned that, yeah, that, that image is, fo is photoshopped. Mm. We also want children to be able to look at videos or look at other types of content and say, well, this has been manipulated somehow. And I think that that's quite important to be more critical about what we're seeing online. Yeah. Uh, that does uh, rather lead to the point that you had of why would I trust it. I, one of the speakers this morning was, uh, well, one of the keynotes this morning, very sort of glancingly mentioned, uh, for instance, racism built into a lot of uh, these recognition systems just because they've been trained on, on wrong data. And we right. see a lot of problems like this. Uh, and then even the good systems are quite often not developed in university environments, but by pri private companies who, who, whose goal obviously is to make money. So. So that, that is two pretty big reasons mm. 
not to trust these systems. And again, where, where does the solution to that lie? Yeah, uh, it depends what you want the system to do mm. uh, and what you're using the system for. Um, and as I said before, I, I really think that the, the future is collaborative where you will see human and machine work together in order to get more than just human, more than just uh, machine. Um, and if you're using a system that is being created by a certain platform where you know that that platform's origin has been uh, a marketing platform to sell things, then you, then you have to ask yourself, well, what kind of information am I getting? So it's, again, that critical thinking. But what I do, and I hope we can start to see, is a plethora, so of, of, um, um, a variety of, of possible solutions. Because right now, we're seeing that the AI solutions are being dominated by very few. And if we really sort of focus on having initiatives that are more needs-driven, healthcare is a beautiful example, mm -hmm. where society, where governments can go in and say, we need more AI here, and not just rely on what we call this kind of outside-in model, where we have the companies doing great things, and then maybe the public sector says, okay, let's use that. But rather, we're, we're really allowing the public sector to be innovative and in giving the mechanisms to innovate. Then I hope that we will see systems that, that we can use and we understand how they're working. Uh, in the background. That does feel super important because I mean, I guess with a lot of the technologies that we are only seeing consequences of today, like we're going, oh, like social media, <laughs> whoops, mm -hmm. or here, what's, what's happening with our data? Oh, part of that, the pro those problems have happened because they were developed in environments where you, if you asked, if you'd walked into, you know, Facebook or Google and asked about many of their projects, why are you building this? Mm. They would say, because it's cool mm. or because we can. So you're building the technology first right. and then thinking about what problem you might solve with it. That's and right. I think, I suppose AI is happening in both of those spaces. AI is developed because it's cool and there are also real problems that need solving. And sometimes those connect, but perhaps not always. In fact, yeah. And I think that what we need is we need to balance it out because it's like you said, there's a lot of AI is being developed because it's cool. And I think we need to balance things out. And I think one of the solutions to add a little bit of balance is to also add diversity in the a field of AI. Yeah. You need other types of minds, other types of individuals with different backgrounds, with different motivations who are coding AI. And right now we're seeing that the diversity, for example, of a machine learning engineer is actually not as diverse as you would think it mm -hmm. should be. So yeah. I think, again, if we go all the way down to lifelong learning, we have to work better to make AI really relevant for everyone so that we have girls, we have boys, we have people with all possible backgrounds wanting to develop this field. Yeah, that's fantastic. I, I think we can't top this advice. Can't talk so anymore. thank you very much. <laughs> Here is some internet chocolate to Excellent. you. Excellent, thank, thank you. Thank you so much, thank Amy Lodfi. Thank you thank so you. much.